Okay, I guess I, I'm going to start now. So uh, welcome to the Women in Tech um, opportunity. It's an opportunity to learn from the experiences of women in tech and the people that support them. My name is Zara Bakshi, and I'm a high school student uh, and, and a senior at Da Vinci Charter Academy in Davis. And I'm one of the co-facilitators of the Davis Girls Who Code Club, which was formed last year by past and current UC Davis students. I grew up in Davis and have been lucky to enjoy so many great opportunities at UC Davis, such as the UC Davis Girls in Robotics Leadership Girls Plus Camp, UC Davis Youth Summer Camps, the Rec Pool, and of course Aggies Games, Picnic Day, and the Whole Earth Festival. I'm excited to share that 196 people have registered for today's event, 86 adults, and 110 uh, children and uh, teens. So first, Lachelle May will speak about her career and experience as a woman in tech. Right after that, at 2 p.m., we will have a panel discussion featuring Nina Mente, Donna Davies, Sean Glantz, and Lachelle May. The audience is welcome to ask our panelists questions. We will end the program with a reception from 3 to 3.30 with event speakers and the UC Davis Gender Equity in IT group which has several women in IT from UC Davis and UC Davis Health here to talk to you and to answer your questions. Today's event really took a village to pull off. I'd like to thank UC Davis Health for helping us get this amazing auditorium and for volunteering at the reception. My school, Da Vinci Charter Academy, helped spread the word about this event through social media and student district channels. I'd also like to thank Davis Media Access, a local nonprofit community media and technology center. Davis Media Access is filming today's uh, event and will make it available to the Davis Public Access television station, DCTV channel 15. Davis Media Access is close to my heart. I took, I took their production and animation summer workshops in elementary school, volunteered there junior high and high school, and did a high school production internship there. Davis Media Access also supports and mentors the Davis Teen Animators Club that I have been a part of for the last four years. So let me introduce our guest speakers for today. Lachelle May is a computer engineer recognized for her leadership and innovation in development of software and web applications. Mrs. May worked at CNN headquarters in Atlanta as a senior software manager and developer for 21 years, and she continues to work as a te senior technical lead. Mrs. May earned her bachelor's in electrical engineering from Bo Boston University, where she was chapter president of the National Society of Black Engineers. She received her master's in operations research from the Georgia Institute of Technology and has served her as a leader of the Georgia Tech alum uh, alum Association, including its student mentoring program. Nina Mente, who is unfortunately not here right now, she will come soon though, is a professor of computer science and the chair of Depart Department of Computer Science at UC Davis. Professor Mente worked for over 10 years as a computer programmer. She then returned to graduate school and earned her PhD from UC Berkeley. She was then a faculty member at the University of Texan at, Texas at Austin and moved to Davis in 2002. Professor Mente works in com computational ge geometry to de develop algorithms for problems in areas like computer graphics and simulation. And Professor Mente is the recipient of the Al Alfred P. Sloan Foundation Research Fellowship and a National Science Foundation Career Award. Sean Glantz is, teaches uh, computer science at UC, uh, Davis Da Vinci Charter Academy. He earned a bachelor's of science in biology from the State University of New York at Albany and a master's of arts in teaching from Oregon State University. Over the past two years, Mr. Glantz has spearheaded the approval of two new computer science uh, courses in the UC in the Davis School District and has grown Da Vinci's computer science program from 17 students in 2018 to 99 students in 2019. 
One of the, his top goals is to recruit more girls in the, into the computer science program so that the diversity in his classroom is more representative of his school's population. I'm in Mr. Glanz's AP computer science class, science class this year, so I really need to do a good, good job with today's program. So. <laughs> De, uh, Donna Davies is a, a career educator and higher education consultant with extensive experience advising women at the UC Davis College of Engineering. She earned her associate's degree in liberal arts, then transferred here to UC Davis, where she earned her bachelor's degree in psychology. She obtained her master's in higher education at Stanford with a thesis on creating an educational pipeline for girls and women in STEM. Mrs. Davies, Ms. Davies is interested in the role of undergraduate research in preparing women for advanced degrees and leadership in STEM, and the power of women, woman to women mentoring. I would now like to invite Lachelle May to the podium to speak about her experience as a woman in tech. Thank you, Zara. Is she not the best? <laughs> I'm so impressed with her. <laughs> Starting with her invitation to me, she emailed me directly, and it was, she's a proud mom, that's a moment. Um, so thanks for having me. Um, oh, I give so many talks, but it's nice to talk to young women about STEM. I get to be nerdy right now, so this is fun. <laughs> um, my first slide, I put this up. How many of you ladies actually watch The Big Bang Theory? Raise your hand. Cool, I like that. How many of you have never heard of the Big Bang Theory? <laughs> well, you're a little younger, but um, I put this up because I feel like it's really cool now to be a nerd. Um, I, when I was in high school, some, who was in high school? Can you raise your hand if you're in high school or middle school? High school and middle school? Okay, so I, I was in high school and middle school one billion years ago. <laughs> And, um, you know, when I was studying physics and calculus and things like that, I was the only girl. And I felt, I knew I was a nerd in high school, but it's, it wasn't, right now, things are changing now. You have programs like this for girls who code. Um, the word STEM didn't exist when I was in high school. Has everybody heard of STEM? And now we're coming up with a new acronym. I don't know if you know STEM M with, you know, for medicine and STEAM and you're continuing the arts. So I put this up because, and it's a little blurry up here actually, because um, this was our, this was kind of like the first TV program to integrate and have some science and math outside of medicine. So I enjoyed this as an engineer and a computer science, right? But you know, so many other shows about medicine. So I just put that up because of that. So I'll tell you a little bit about me quickly, not they don't want to bore you to death. Um, who knows what city this is? Scream it out. New York. Yeah. I'm a native New Yorker. And I grew up, my maiden name is Rodriguez. Um, my father's Cuban. And I grew up in an inner city part of New York City where it was predominantly um, uh, Dominican, Puerto Rican, Hispanic, low income area. I can tell you right now where I grew up in New York City, I couldn't afford to live right now because New York has changed. But um, about me is that um, my journey to get here, I shouldn't be here statistic wise. You know, I, I was low income, a female, an African American. Who knew that I would be married to the chancellor beside that part? But our worlds met because of math and science. So I, I just bring that point out. Um, then I, my, I had the my mom had the wherewithal to move me from New York City to New Jersey. And in New Jersey, I went to parochial school. I was probably maybe your age when I moved to New Jersey, middle school. And um, I was exposed to more AP courses. And that allowed me to think further than what I knew in New York City and in, in um, Spanish Harlem. And I'm gonna fast forward to this one, but um, 
I started, I studied AP, I had AP courses and then I started at uh, Boston University studying electrical engineering. Does anybody know what electrical engineering really is or can give me an idea of what you think it, what do you think that is? No. Anybody want to tell me what you think? Engineering, any type of engineering. Let's try. Figuring out how things work and making it work. Yes, that, engineers, that's what they do. Whether you're a civil engineer, you can help bridges, um, waterways. Um, mechanical engineers work on com uh, parts of robots. Um, then you have aerospace, they worry about, they build airplanes. I studied electrical engineering, and electrical engineering is really the meat of understanding your cell phone. I put that as an example, your iPad, the devices that are inside that, that have circuits and wiring. Many, many years ago, a computer, your phone, would take up this whole building, but that's the power of your phone. So years ago, I studied electrical engineering, and in order for me, as an African-American woman, or woman, just a woman, in a class, filled with uh, you know, all males and Asian males, I was the only one. And so um, you, the courses are very difficult. There's no, when you study engineering and computer science, your courses are not light. Every single course is intense. I mean, you're going from calculus to physics to signals and systems and all these different type of things that are, if you just take physics and go to a new level, that's how hard the courses are. So I put this up there. This is the National Society of Black Engineers. I became a member um, in college, and that got me through because it was an, an, a, an organization that I could lean on and just have fun with, learn with, study with. And so I, my advice to you, when you, while you're in high school and then you go to college, join some type of affinity group. Um, th there's miles of research that indicate, and you may know more about this, that you will succeed if you join something in college and high school, a band or whatever it is. Um, but mine was this, because um, we studied together and I had an avenue and um, that helped. So, this is where I work. Um, who's never heard of CNN? <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if she hadn't. <laughs> but has everybody here heard of CNN? <laughs> <You'll see? laughs> um, so, um, you know, it's a, it's a household name and I've enjoyed my time there. Um, I'll, I'll give you a glimpse of my job, so it's not just overwhelming. I won't get into many details so I don't bore you to death. But um, this is, what I do is I build web applications for the newsroom. So there's a CNN.com, there's a CNN app that you may have on your phone as parents if you keep up. Um, then there's CNN Linear. CNN, CNN Linear is what we air to TV, and digital is what we provide digitally. So web app, phone app. And so I build applications. So just imagine I'm building like an Amazon.com for CNN, for the newsroom. So this is actually a, one of the applications that I built. Um, and you can see up top the situation room is Wolf Blitzer. He's one of our anchors. And you ladies may not even know him, but maybe your parents do. <laughs> um, but he's one of our key anchors. And this is a type of show, this is a type of web application that allows Wolf Blitzer's team to create a rundown. So at CNN, when you air something, in any show that you watch on TV, it goes like this. If it's a 3 p.m. show, there's an entire group of people who are building your TV show from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. And every slot is, has some kind of content, commercial, or something about the show. And those are called rundowns. So this is actually a, a web application I built for rundown. So every single rundown at CNN will use this. And as you can see, um, they have an intro show. Uh, at this point that I grabbed this, it said Trump assails major parts of Obama's legacy, I don't know. And then commercial break, out of commercial break, show, show, show. I can't display it because I can't show you what it really is, but this is a cool app because it allows the newsroom to drag and drop content in here so I can build drag and drop stuff. Really fun computer science geeky stuff um, that allows them to open and close things and bring in content from the newsroom, I mean, um, newspapers, etc. But this is just an example of something that we use right now. The reason I have television versus IP up here is because this app is also available via IP. Television now is changing. How many of you guys, let me ask you right here. 
Would you be more mad that your Wi-Fi went out or versus your cable? Maybe Wi-Fi. See? <laughs> so IP in, in our world means Wi-Fi. So as, as CNN is starting to change our linear content is TV, we realize this is a whole new generation who are not interested in TV, but more interested in IP. So this right here is a, is a web app that we allow distributed to mobile applications too. So it's just something how things are changing. That's a, a picture of the, one of our control rooms is um, control room A. I just wanted you to get a glimpse of what CNN's like. Um, and you can see um, we have, in every newsroom, we watch all the other stations to know what's happening and who's displaying what. This is another application that I built, and this one actually, I won a technical Emmy, not a primetime Emmy. It's a technical Emmy. <laughs> Let's not get it twisted. <laughs> actually, my husband's like, we're gonna go get you an Emmy. I wanna go with you and a bunch of nerds. <laughs> but um, this became the first newsroom, digitized, digitized newsroom web app. Years ago, you may not remember because you were a little bit, do your parents have tape decks? You ever seen a tape? Yes. At, at CNN, we used to like wind tapes and bring in the news that way. And then, so we changed it 20 years ago to be digitized. And that's really why I was hired there. So um, this is a, an, a web application called Media Source. And basically what it does is it's just every single piece of video that comes into the newsroom is one row. And you can watch um, the, the play and thumbnails that come out. This is a lot of work. It's a lot of UI work and a lot of back-end work for those who are. Is anybody in here actually coding? Uh, do we have any girls who code? Yeah. Somewhat? Are you ladies thinking about it? Well, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so this right here is kind of like a, a, every person in the newsroom will use this because this is where you add uh, robust content to every single piece of video. So I'll give, you, I'll give you a heads up. CNN built had video before YouTube existed. Like I started here when there was not an internet, but we had content and content is a YouTube video. YouTube came way after us, y'all, I'm just here to tell you. <laughs> just way after us. <laughs> um, and you can see this is kind of like our video feed. Um, each of those are routers that bring in, do you guys, have you guys heard of satellites? There's satellites in the world that feed us content day and night. This is the Atlanta Bureau. We have bureaus in London, all over. I've been to all of them. But they really just bring in the content via these routers. It's a black box. But anyway, at the end of the day, this is a YouTube video. Now, it's just bringing in digitized content. And that room, that room that had content, you could see these are all ingests that are happening right now. So it's kind of like somebody's taping or uh, you having your phone coming in. This is all, these are things that have been aired or coming in and these are being ingested right now and these are soon to be scheduled. So for us at CNN, we constantly schedule content over and over again. Again, this is a web application that I helped build. And so I'm just trying to get you a feel of the, you know, the kind of work that I do in terms of uh, software development. I just want to briefly talk about the impact of software, which I'm sure our panel will discuss. Um, I just happen to, to gravitate toward a great field. Um, this, if, you, if you go anywhere in software, you will never be unemployed. <laughs> um, there's always a job out there. Um, the reach of software is endless. Um, every device that you have will require some type of software development. Um, every website, you can't even shop. Where do you shop? Give me a place where you may shop. Where do you shop? Room 21. Yep. Do they have a website? Yeah. They have an app? That's where you shop, right? You, do, do you really go into the store? Oh, you do. <laughs> well, some stores, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, most of your generation would love, love to shop online. Um, so the websites are endless, and you can't have a business without one. Um, and so that requires uh, development and uh, software people. And then music is plays into this. I always bring this up because you, it does transform into the arts. Um, we've digitized music, and then robotics is the artificial intelligence. Who's heard of artificial intelligence? 
Yeah, see? Everybody's heard of artificial I like that. <laughs> That's good stuff. Um, but um, that plays in, this is actually uh, 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 made for someone who's a quadriplegic. They have this new um, robotic thing where it can follow his brain and walk. It's kind of cool. That's my, not me. I, I've not stepped into these other worlds. I'm strictly a web developer, website developer. This cross-pollination between software and bio, biotechnical engineering. Um, for a fact, I know that, the, who knows what this is? Everybody knows what that is. <laughs> Do we all have one? Or, <laughs> um, so that's an ear pod. Um, you kids have all had devices in your ear from a very young age, right? I'm old, I have not had a device in my ear from a very young age. Your hearing will be compromised before mine. I guarantee you that, right? Do you know what this is on, the, on that side? Do you hear Nate? Okay. So uh, there's research now to have, make sure that you guys can hear your music and have an ear Nate. Because <laughs> you may need one before then. But that may not be the truth. This is research that I do know is going on. But I just wanted you kids to see how you have biotechnical engineering cross-pollinating with um, technical stuff that's happening now. So when we have the device that you may need in probably 15 years, you'll be able to hear your music and hear, because your hearing will be compromised. Mm -hmm. So how can you make it better so your hearing won't be compromised with listening to music with stuff in your ear? Is there a way to make it better for you so you don't get a hearing aid stuck in your ear? Yeah, that's an engineering. Well, I, 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 I just, I, by default, listening to devices in your ears that close compromises your hearing. The only way not to is just not to start listening to music. When we were growing up, we didn't have AirPods. We didn't even have hearing things, that, and they were big, giant things on your ears. So you guys, I mean, you, and then your music's louder, and you know, so you can't get around it. But, we're, but this type of device will allow you to hear your device as well as improve your hearing. I'm, I, not everybody's going to be a hearing aid. I'm not a, a need one. I'm not a doctor. I'm just telling you. I know that this research is going on, so the worlds do collide. Did you have a question? Okay. <laughs> and then software apps. Who's ever actually played with software with mobile apps? Um, yeah, Developing one? Yeah. Okay. Um, but I'm sure everybody's. Uh, the question is, who hasn't used an app to, in this room? I'm sure all of you have, yeah. So that's a lot of software it takes to build one. Um, I can get into the different languages, et cetera, but um, that's not my expertise. But um, it's a good one. And it's hot right now, so if you're thinking about it. I put this up um, because I wasn't, I, sh I thought maybe we would have some high school kids who were interested in, in um, learning different languages. So this is a very technical slide. Um, so, I, it was almost homework for somebody like Zora. <laughs> but um, there's a word called purple squirrel. Has anybody heard of that word before? No? Have you heard of it? Yeah. It's, um, you've heard of it? Uh, no. uh, no. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, does anybody in here work? Or have a job. Well, a kid. Yeah. <laughs> so, any of the little kid, any teenagers work or have? You? I had one. What was your job? I babysit kittens. You babysit kittens. Okay. So the idea of a purple squirrel is. I'm gonna see if I can relate it to um, babysitting kittens. It's actually a list of qualifications for a job that almost and possible to fill in, that you are just dynamic. So it would be, if I'm looking for someone to babysit my kid and I wanted them to be um, five foot two, um, actually in the fourth grade and have four A's and two B's, and um, that they could come to my house and have all these stipulations that you think, really, who can fill that? But that, that's kind of what that job description means. And there are a lot of software jobs out there, and software or not software, but they call them a purple score. And I put that up here because I'm going to talk about these four things that I think can make, um, would be 
the avenue to being a purple squirrel. And a full stack developer for us in the software world is a person who can develop the UI, the fun stuff that you see, and the back end stuff that you see. So again, remind me who in here has done software, uh, who's in Girls Who Code with you? You, Zara, and is anybody else here in the, the oh, or in the course? No? Okay. <laughs> Well, I, I won't get too details because I know we have some young middle school kids here, but briefly, um, software developers, I was gonna tell you, you need an IDE, which allows you an environment to do your software coding on your um, machines, your laptops, et cetera. Everybody has a laptop, right? Yeah. Um, the language is, is powerful. I always say gravitate toward one, master it, and then the others become easier. Um, understand databases this is one that I never get from college kids that know well the database structures and some system admin sh stuff um, I don't know if you do your students play with some system admin things like uh, Mac OS not, not, not much. much okay yeah and that's one that I say so I say if you if you whoever's in here who is in girls who code and is thinking about um, this as a future these four entities will make you the purple squirrel and give you the full st stack development tools that you need to become very proficient. Um, I'm excited to be here with girls who are thinking about this. Um, the future looks good. Forbes recently named UC Davis the first among best value colleges for women in STEM. So we have hats off. We're really excited about that one. Um, Nesby, when I was in Nesby, was very small, but has grown to 25,000 members, so that's great improvement there as well. And we're here with the Vinci Girls of Code, right? So this is success. Um, women in STEM is growing. I could give many, many more examples of what's happening there. And finally, who's seen this picture before? You know who she is? You've seen the picture before. Does anybody know who she is? Zara? No? I put her face up there. She's Grace Hopper. She's the first female. You know who you heard of her? Yeah, I know who she is. She's, um, she helped work on like, the first computer ever created. Yes. And her inspiration was like, from her grandpa and her grandpa who like, taught her. And she was in the Coast Guard. And she was right. a lot of Mm -hmm. Yeah, she, she developed the first compiler. You're exactly right. Yay, girls here. <laughs> so, um, I, I'm, I'm into with this. This is it. Um, so, any questions? No? Well, you want to open it to the panel? Or, or yeah. did you have a question? Well, I, I just wanted to know to know who like really influenced you a lot in like getting into STEM like was there someone who just kind of pushed you in that direction yeah um that's a good question um both of my parents were not in STEM and um but my I gravitated toward math and science so by default I knew I wanted to study something for example when I was in high school I signed up for AP physics, and then I did AP history, and I thought I was going to die in AP history. <laughs> it's like the worst course. But I love the AP physics, so it was like by default that I knew that I had to do something in that area. I was not excited about biology. So STEM is, um, you've got the computational sciences and the non-computational sciences. So biology is the non-computational. So I didn't really care to memorize a whole bunch of things, which would have led me to medicine and that kind of field, or biological sciences, but I preferred the mathematics, so, yeah. Were any of your friends like questioning what you wanted to do, or like wondering why you chose STEM or math? Um, no, not really. That's a really good question. Um, back then, again, we didn't have the word STEM, um, and, in high school or middle school or 
either or, yeah. Um, no, not really. Um, again, I went back to that first slide. I really do think I was a nerd in high school. <laughs> So um, I had my little group, you know, and so we, I just, I just gravitated and made sure I hung out with the people who were alike, who were with me. So not really. Um, Do you know a program on your site that would help introduce um, STEM and coding to a young girl? Like me? The, uh, uh, you mean the girls who code? This kind of program? No, I'm, I'm just, this is a great program yeah, for it. so you can join Girls Who Code. It's nationwide, and there's several clubs. We ran a club um, the be like the beginning of this uh, year, and it was very successful. If you want to learn it by yourself, I would highly recommend doing um, Code Studio, code.org. Um, Mr. Glantz actually teaches that class also. It, if you go to school and they have a course, you can try doing it yourself. But um, by yourself, I always found doing an hour of code or 20 hours of code on the website code.org. It was phenomenal and taught me a lot, and it's very helpful. Um, I do. Uh, um, let me see if I can go back to the can slide I that I had. That can I add to that? Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Uh, Investigate the resources at NSF.org that are specifically focused for women and girls advancing into engineering and science. So in those spaces, you can find these, I kind of like dandy, um, annotated, you know, quick and dirty lists of what is biomedical engineering, what is biotechnology, what is mechanical engineering, what is aerospace engineering, you know, and, and, and so NSF.org, it's division focused on, that, that's totally dedicated to diversifying, you know, our critical industries, especially across gender and ethnicity, where we still don't have proportionate representation, right? Um, lots of resources in there at NSF.org in the division of diversification of engineering. And you can see a lot of early education and then middle school, and then high school, and then pre-college preparation in STEM and, and engineering and STEAM. I like that new term. That's awesome. Because I like the Renaissance people who are like down, dabble in the arts and dabble in engineering. You know? So the STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. Is that what that is? Yes. Yeah. Neat. Engineering, yeah. arts, and music. I mean, mathematics. Yeah. Sorry. So and sort of like. And they're adding another M in the skulls. Yeah. Literally, Da Vinci is um, right? So, yeah, check out yeah. NSF.org. Some good resources. Sorry for the introduction, but our um, camera person reminded um, us to use our mics. When oh, the, the oh. I'm sorry. Okay. Is my voice carrying enough? Shall I be louder? Yeah. Not for the video, right? <laughs> okay. Can you repeat those two? Uh, so, I mainly use, um, it's called code.org. That's um, a website that's completely free. You just sign up with your email, uh, and then also um, the it's called um, Girls Who Code, the nationwide um, clubs. Um, I don't know exactly when the Davis one will start again, but we normally hold it every year. So. If you're interested, um, you should take a snapshot of this page. Um, because, I mean, of this slide, and the only reason I say that is because whatever you learn, you're gonna touch on something here. You're gonna either hit a language, JavaScript is the hottest language right now in terms of jQuery bundle packages that allow you to build web apps in a day. Um, we have these enterprises with Node.js and Ruby on Rails that you can Google and play. Do you have a Mac or a window? I'm a Mac person. Mac, Mac yeah. Um, so be careful when you download things. Make sure it's for the Mac. Um, if you're seriously thinking about it, your ID is the most important piece. It, it's, you, it's, a, it's an application you'll download to your Mac or machine, and then it'll allow you to play with um, code and software that you integrate. Um, these things right here, are the places where you get your code. It's like a pulling in 
get hubs and get CBS. And then if, if, as you play on your Mac and machines start to know them better, um, commands and different things that allow you to maneuver through your servers. These are actually called servers now. Years ago, a server was a big giant room, but now these Macs are so powerful, your phone's a server, really. And um, I'll save this one. This is really for advancement. I was thinking I was talking to some kids, you know, old, a little older. Uh, but your language is the best thing. Learn some CSS, that's really fun. That's the color and the gooey and the making things drag, drop, jump, gifts and fun stuff like that. I, I love this stuff. I could, I wish I could take you home. No. <laughs> do, you, do you have a team that backs you up? Like your, oh yeah. The, you have a, how many people does it take to develop like, your whole schedule? Yeah, no, 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 no. Um, we. I'll be honest, when I first joined CNN, I was the only developer. Like, this was a news organization. There wasn't CNN.com, right? So, for a while I was a key developer working on these different projects. Um, but then as, you know, the internet grew, et cetera. So now the whole CNN.com group is a whole different monster. I don't even bother with them. Our group is about, um, uh, we have like, four senior managers. I was a senior manager before I moved here. And then there's teams underneath that. So I'd say a good 100 people to maintain all the newsroom web application. It's a lot. I just gave you the most powerful ones that we use um, because it's you, the content becomes really important. So um, yeah, but now it's a big group. So, and when I won the technical Emmy 20 years ago, it was a small group, I could claim it. Now we win we win Peabody Awards for some of our technical work, but it's the whole team that wins it, so. Mine was special. <laughs> what brought you to work in news media and uh, CNN? Like, what, what made you want to go and work for a specific company? That, that's a good question. And I love that question coming from you because you guys, the world is your oasis. You think about where do you want to go, specifically what do you do? Like, let me tell you something, darling. Three, many, many years ago, I was just happy to get a job. <laughs> you know, way back when, it, was, it wasn't that way. But how I actually got that job, my job at CNN was I did a great job with another company. I used to work for a consulting company called Arthur Anderson, which is now Accenture. And my hiring manager there said, oh, we're trying to launch CNN.com. Do you want to come and join? I love to have you. The job was mine. I didn't even apply for it. She just wanted me. And I had a good friend who was my quality assurance. So if you know every website that you play on a mobile app, there is a quality assurance. And you know what? Do you have any idea what that person would do? You are good. That's exactly right. A quality assurance of any site is most critical, is to make sure that things work the way they should. But she and I came as a pair to CNN. And that, and I just been there, and I, I tell you something, it's the best job that I, I, I've been there 23 years and I never feel like I work a day in my life. It's a fun, fun job. Everything I do is something new every single day. So um, it's, you know, it's not like I'm, doing the same job every day. It's just always something new happening in the news. So we, okay. One more question. Oh, one so, more question. Um, when you first started working in a field that was traditionally male dominated, what strategies did you use to advocate for yourself or make sure that people um, took you seriously and respected you? Um, yeah, um, good question. Um, let me see how I could politically say this. I, 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 when I knew I was right or I felt dismissed, I would always say to the men in the room, okay, when I prove you wrong, I reserve the right to tell you I told you so. <laughs> so I've never been the one to, to be very vocal about my opinion a lot. I just knew I had to be academic. I tell you girls, always know your stuff. I could say another word instead of that. Yeah. But always know your stuff. Study very, very hard. So there's no doubt you know what you're talking about. And that's what I've always done too. But when I was confronted of like, oh, that's, you know, she, she don't know. She's just, you know, 
I would say, oh, mm -hmm, and, and know that I knew my stuff and then prove them wrong later. Um, but there's many times I was not included at lunch or activities, but I found my own way I would work out or do something else. So not being included sometimes is hard, but you once you get a mentor or an advocate for you within your company or area, that helps. So I had an advocate for me so that, uh, actually a female who was a VP and that helped me too. I don't know if I answered your question, but um, yeah. Okay. I have a question for you. You hit upon something that's so significant as far as advocacy goes. Mm -hmm. Advocates, I think kids have heard mentors, mm -hmm. but advocate, approaching an advocate, how do you develop that kind of relationship? Because even now at their age, they really need to know how to do that. Yeah. With, for whatever they do. So can you give some advice on how they can develop advocate relationships? Or what's the difference between a mentor and an advocate? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's a good that, that's a good question. I think a mentor is um mm, hmm, uh, uh, somebody who can temporarily help you through something, but an advocate will watch your whole life. I think it's just like a, like a journey, like a, advocating for you every step along the way. But a mentor could say, hey, I want you to study this or do this. I, I, I mean, to me, an advocate is a long journey, somebody, a lifetime friend or a lifetime, and could put a good word for you or help you out in some way. You may know more about the whole advocate. Now, in terms of how you speak for yourself and find one, um, um, that's another part that I'm not sure is networking, and um, networking is a is a big thing too, and business acumen, and that comes into are you approachable, and and um, um, you know, it's almost this is almost an adult question. I'm not sure. Sorry. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm not sure how to how to you know, bring it down. bring it yeah. down to their level because there's you know the, you guys get a little bit of time. These things you don't worry about this stuff too soon. <laughs> Thank you. So, if, so. I, if I may, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. 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 I think you have a keen opportunity with the web being what it is, where you can you can learn about somebody before you approach them, right? So, uh, for example, I would often coach women in the engineering programs here on campus. You know, before you go in and try to talk to a faculty member and say, "Gee, you know, could I come in and do some research in your lab?" or um, you know, could I cross some kind of a boundary that wasn't just already available in curricular delivery, I would say like, you know, go pull three of their papers, read their papers. You may not be able to get your head around like every little detail, you know, at your, at your stage in education, but you'll be able to discern kind of the general gist of the paper, the thesis, the, um, the methods and the conclusions. And faculty love to talk about their research, right? So if you go in and you appeal to their sensibilities and say something open-ended like, you know, I noticed that you were working in, um, you know, carbon-based nanotubes to deliver medicine to tumors in the body. Could you tell me more about that? So it's describing and being authentic about your intellectual curiosities, right? And even and then that leads to opportunities to start talking about your career curiosities. And by the time you are in that lab, maybe under wing of a graduate student, maybe that professor may not have a whole lot of time to directly intellectually or scientifically mentor you, but they can be present for you and also deliver an opportunity to their graduate student to really take you under their wing. And ideally it's a woman or a woman of color who is relatable and connected to you and advocates for you, like you, you talked about. So mentoring, but also giving that graduate student the opportunity to learn to mentor, because they'll eventually be faculty, right? And we want them to be approachable when that next generation of undergrads or high schoolers 
approaches and says, gee, you know, can you tell me more about the science that I read that you conduct? So I think that that's one door in, and that's even true in work settings, right? So um, maybe before approaching somebody who you've noticed up the ranks who is doing something you're interested in or you think might have some merit in advancing you in your career, um, find out what they've done, you know, just notice, and then connect on that level and and be open-ended about it and authentic. You know, I really want to learn more about this. Can you tell me more about this? So, thanks. I think it was helpful. Yeah. So, I will be now starting off the panel. So, if all the panelists can come on up. Um, so, I'm going to start off by asking a few questions and then we're going to basically kind of have like a conversation up here. And then when I finish asking my questions, I'd love for all of you to ask your own questions and can I'll give you information. So. All right, so I would like to ask my first question. My first question is, why should women work in the tech field? Who would like to take that first? I'll go. I'm uh, Nina Amenta. Um, I'm the uh, former chair of the computer science department here at UC Davis. Um, and I also teach the course in uh, web programming, oh. So it's a, which is a great class. Anyway. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, I think there's a lot of good reasons why women should go into tech, which is similar to the reasons that men should go into tech, which is, um, first of all, it's really interesting field. I mean, you're, you're never bored. Uh, there's always new things to learn. Uh, there's always puzzles to be solving. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's, there's uh, uh, yeah, so you know, it's, it's very intellectually stimulating. Um, also, it pays really well. No. <laughs> No problem with that, you know. I mean, I, I think since I graduated from college and started working, you know, I felt confident in my financial independence. It's been great, it's very satisfying. Um, uh, and the other thing is that uh, it, there's a lot of directions that you could go in tech. You know, that you can always, uh, if you change your mind later in your career, you want to do something else. There's a lot of opportunities to move into into something slightly different, where you're spending more time working with people or you're spending more time on uh, you know, a particular problem that you want to solve, or you, know, you, you just have a lot of freedom. Sure. Um, yeah, so I think, again, a lot of reasons. I would echo uh, all of those that you had just said. Um, another thing is, so I think that uh, technology right, has, is, is influencing everything. Our world is so rapidly changing, so uh, we have a lot of new problems in this um, in our in our world today, and I think that we are going to need to leverage all of the tools available to address those. And when we have uh, a number of uh, our population that is not engaging in those problems, those are minds and ideas that are not being put forth. Right. So um, I think it's really important when we look at half the world's population being women that we have the whole population engaged in solving the problems of today. That's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. um, I would just say one more piece, um, diversity in mind. Um, it's so well known that um, when a woman is present in some kind of new, whether it's a new app or whatever, that, that diversity of mind, the product will prosper. Um, you ladies may not know things like, um, for example, I'll give you an example. Um, um, when they first invented the um, airbags, um, they didn't have a woman. My husband uses this one. We both know this one. When they first invented airbags, you girls would have died if it popped open on you because they didn't have a woman in the research f facility trying to figure out, oh, well, the frames are smaller. Hello. So um, you have to have that in, in the mix as well, as well as minorities too, so, but women is important too. I, I love all those points about why women should go into the tech industry, and that's okay. So I'd like to also open up the question of like, what 
are some of the challenges that women will face when they're so interested in the tech field and the majors that are out there? So, um, working with mostly high school populations, what I've found as a challenge is, um, I would say it's not your fault, but the way that our high school system uh, kind of sets you up to go through their checkbox list of high school degree requirements, and then you're suddenly supposedly able to just pick a major, but you haven't had much career exposure to decide like, well, a major is supposed to map to my eventual career plans. So you're asked to really, you're asked kind of an impossible question to answer in an informed way, right? Unless you've spent some time in high school and maybe even as early as middle school, certainly in elementary school too. Summer camps, um, but also I think using your network and now a fifth grader in this room might say like, network? I don't have a network, I'm only in fifth grade, I'm only nine or 10 years old. Well, actually you do. So our first networks are who? Our families, our communities, our schools, right? And so one of the challenges that I often see with high schoolers about to sit down and write their college essay is like, well, gosh, you know, um, I had my nose to the grindstone. I was working really hard. I did really well with my grades. And I did all the, I jumped through all the hoops they told me to, but I don't really have a lot, I don't think I have a lot to say in this essay because I haven't had, you know, experiences to put my intellectual curiosities to the battle test, you know, like in a summer internship or, um, or a science immersion college program. Um, and so I would say the biggest challenge that I could tell you now to try to like ward off when you get to that point is create experiences for yourself. Jump in and try things. Use that network. And by that, I mean like your parents' friends. In every person in this room has a parent who probably has five friends at least who kind of cross uh, the disciplines, right, or the or the industries that we think about as being sort of co common, um, engineering and science, medicine, uh, law, um, education, uh, environmental studies and environmental work, uh, policy. I mean, so and and leaderships in the leadership in their own right, maybe not with title and prestige and privilege, but. Let me tell you, being the lead grounds person at a campus like UC Davis is leadership, okay? And so in your set, in your parent friend set, you have a network and if you have people that w are willing to let you just shadow them for like four hours on the job, you know, on some afternoon that maybe your teacher will release you or maybe you can hit that workspace at two o'clock as soon as the bell rings or three o'clock, whatever. Go and do those things and, and doing things when you're young, immersed in things you think you might want to do, and finding out, oh God, I hate this, or I don't like this environment, that's time well spent, right? Because you've ruled out um, a whole lot of time and years and money that you might go spend in a degree program or pursuit of a career that you won't, that won't fulfill you and that doesn't really keep you up at night. Because I really think grad school, undergrad school, and then some of the biggest questions in our jobs, you know, that we're called to answer and solve, they should keep us up at night. Like we should be driven by an intellectual and an emotional and a, you know, a social and professional drive to make transformative change, right? Because that keeps us fresh and strong, and especially as women, like, you know. Man, just listening to your, you know, uh, small short bio is like, whoa, impressive. This is somebody I trust and want to listen to. She's got accomplishments under her belt. So you can start that accomplishment list today, and it's free. Use your networks. Yeah. Uh, so 
I guess, again, I think one of the, the maybe initial barriers, and myself as a middle school and high school teacher, so the lens that I'm taking is that, that first experience, right? Or that first step into maybe this is something I'm interested in, maybe this is something I have a knack for. Um, and so there are unfortunately like limited opportunities right now because as you mentioned, there are so many boxes to check. Um, so letting your teachers know, letting people around you know that this is something that you're interested in exploring. I have a lot of my seventh grade students come up to me and say, are we doing coding in, in seventh grade science? And I always try to make a little space for it, but uh, there are those opportunities and uh, also talking to your teachers about doing something even like uh, like the hour of code, which is a great just first step into what is computer science and programming. And there are resources for for your teachers um, or for your peers or your parents and guardians um, to help support you in those kinds of uh, first experiences, even if they themselves uh, don't have the expertise in it, right? It's really uh, can be an empowering experience to kind of learn side by side with somebody who is is also like a mentor and advocate. Yeah. I'll just throw in one more thing, which is high school students nowadays have uh, this great advantage that wasn't around when I was a kid, which is these robotics clubs. They're just fantastic, and uh, you know, it's a it's a great way to learn about what you like and what you don't like, and uh, uh, you know, meet friends and stuff like that. I would also kind of just say what, like, especially for myself as, you know, a high school student here, I have found that for especially I wanted to get into computer science and I found, oh, I'm not good enough was the thing popping in my head so many times. Oh, I can't do this. I'm not smart enough for this. And I would always compare myself to the other, for some reason, guys in my class. I, they always were smarter than me in my own head and I realized with just kind of looking in, I do have the potential, plus also, it's not just about the coding, there's so many passages within computer science, within tech. It's not just the one thing about you have to sit at a computer all day and code, there's so many different aspects, and that's what I love about it. That's why I got back into deciding I wanna be a woman in tech. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm going to ask my next question more so our question was before kind of just for students now I want to think about what are the, some of the challenges women will face in a tech industry what, what are some of those challenges so I spent uh, several years in industry between when I graduated from like uh, college and went on to graduate school and um, uh, that was certainly a challenging period where, um, uh, you know, I was one of very few women in my lab. Um, uh, there was, uh, it, you know, people would have posters of naked women in their offices and stuff that like nowadays would never be allowed. Um, <laughs> um, and um, uh, so uh, uh, things, uh, things, you know, got, much much better in the in, in the intervening years, um, uh, uh, but now you know from from what I read and when I talk to people, there's this impression that things are are starting to get a little more difficult again, um, and that there's there's be, you know beginning to be this sort of clubby, bro type culture in uh, in industrial settings. Um, so uh, I think it, you know it's 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 certainly challenging. Um, and I think one of the things that uh, was positive about it for me was that, um, uh, you know, I like self-consciously identified as uh, a feminist, you know, and so I was like, this is my opportunity to enter a male-dominated environment, you know. This is my opportunity to demonstrate that, you know, I'm smarter than at least half here because I'm average you know <laughs> um, uh, uh, you know this is my opportunity to call out sexism in the workplace yes you know <laughs> so um, uh, it's it's unfortunate you know that, that people have to deal with it but um, uh, in a way you know if you want to like see yourself as a warrior and as a change maker it's an opportunity yeah, well, I'm still in corporate America, right? Yeah. I've been there all my life. I've not been in academia. Um, 
it depends on the field. So there are a lot of fields out there that you ladies can choose from in terms of tech. I, I've been, we've, we're here to talk about computer science. And of course that, that sounds sexy because you can go to Google and Facebook and LinkedIn, you can build websites for a news network, et cetera. But there's a whole world out there. Um, you get back to robotics, you could be on a team to help, who's heard of that robot, the um, iRobot? Does anybody have an iRobot, right? <laughs> I mean, you could be on a team to build that, and that is a technical world. You could be um, help building airplanes. What about the five ladies who just flew to the NASA? Yeah, that, that's an all, who's heard of, who, did you, ladies here, the all women? I mean, that's cool. You could be part of that. The tech industry is vast, so um, uh, the, so it depends on which field you go to. There are some that have a lot of dated um, men, I should say, that have been there a long time. And then you can go into an environment with a lot of young millennials. You guys, I think, are Gen Z. And so if you step into an environment where a lot of millennials, you'll have less of it because they're custom and they're not taking it, right? So I love that about this industry. And so for me, I became the change, the voice at CNN. Being the only woman for so long, I started to say, okay, now we need, I need to give back. So I started to hire more women. So the problem here sometimes, and what you're alluding to is that there are not a lot of women in higher structures, so just imagine how many CEOs you had that were women from the top down. They could say, hey, look, we need to increase the numbers. So what I started to do was a bottom up. Let's increase more women bottom, and then by default, you guys, the women will grow and grow and grow. So I see your question, but it all depends on the environment in which you go to, and it's a whole vast world out there with IT, um, so yeah. Also, I mean, most IT jobs are not in the tech industry. You know, they're not at Google and Facebook. They're, you know, doing the IT for a hospital. They're doing the IT for a company that makes dish soap. You know, um, there's a huge number of jobs out there. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, different companies have wildly different cultures. You know, and it's it's a, a and, 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 and that's a that's a big opportunity because anything that you're interested in in addition to programming, right, there's probably a way to combine those. You know, programming is like writing. You've got to write about something. You've got to program about something, you know. And so uh, it, it's a great way to, uh, that, you know, that, so different sectors, you should be looking at all sorts of different sectors. Um, one thing that I might add, too, that you had alluded to before is uh, there's been a lot of progress, a lot of positive change in the last decade and recently, right, um, where we've been seeing more women getting into tech. Uh, and, and that's great, and I'm actually an optimist and see it continuing that way, but I think it is also important to notice that when we see these positive trends, it's easy to step back and say things are gonna be fine, right? And the reason we've seen these positive trends is because there's so many um, advocates, right, uh, <laughs> saying that we need these changes need to happen, and so, keeping our mind on like why that change is occurring at the rate it is and seeing what, what parts can we all play in continuing that momentum and keeping that change uh, moving forward. So just to recap on the question was, what are the challenges of being in a male-dominated environment? Or? And mostly just kind of what challenges women will face in the tech industry. Yeah, so I guess from a feminist standpoint, um, many of you girls and women in here have probably already felt the marginalization or the isolation or being singled out um, for being intellectually curious um, or displaying traits that conventionally have been associated with boy stuff. I mean, can you raise your hand and just be real brave and honest about that? Anybody feeling that in their classroom environments sometimes, sometimes? Yeah. Yeah, you don't actually, yeah, you don't have to feel that way. But, um, so, I think, like, so as a woman who's a member of another proud minority group, right? I'm a woman with a disability, right? And so we have a legacy, too, of um, historical underrepresentation in every 
level, like higher education, uh, career fulfillment, uh, underemployment, um, and then you add triple whammies like black, lesbian, and blind, you know, and then you've got, you've got people with intersectional identities that don't even get to really fit in any of their communities, right, fully, and be embraced and empowered. So what I would say is, um, as girls and women, and then additional traits and backgrounds that you all stem from, uh, be that ethnic, religious, citizenship status, whatever that is, disability, the, it's crucial that you connect to your community. Like wherever you are, at whatever educational level you're in, like find somebody that looks like you. It may seem like you can't, but I bet you can. And even if you just have one person that looks like you that you can get real with and just talk about on the down low to start out, like what you're experiencing, what you're witnessing, and get that support and that empowerment, and that person who can look to you and go like, yeah, it's not you, it's them. Do you know what I'm saying? That, that is the, that's the difference between survival and attrition in education, right? So not being alone. And if it takes you, you know, that first semester on a, you know, wildly, radically different campus to what you're used to or a popu inside of a population of people that might have like more money, more prestige, more accomplished parents or whatever, you know, the comparative rankism that we, we foist on people in the society, go find your tribe, like whoever it is and whatever it is, if it's just the other girls in your CS class or the other women in your CS class or the other women that you saw at the Nesby conference, you know, go find those people and be brave because even if you're scared, that doesn't mean it's not worth doing, right? Take some risks, make some connections, and that will give you the power and the bravery to stick on the days when you really feel like quitting or giving up or leaving this, you know, bewildering place that just doesn't get you and doesn't embrace you. You know what I mean? And um, yeah, that's what I would say. Like that's how we meet the challenge of of sexism or any kind of like racial or social marginalization is go find our go find our people and like connect to them, help them out on the days when they're struggling, and lean on them when the days when you are. Okay. say this, as a white woman with a disability, having a disability and being called to consistently kind of fight for my spot and my space, like from an architectural standpoint, right? Like this world still isn't anywhere near how accessible it needs to be to integrate women like me. But let's also talk about other disability identities, ADD, ADHD, people with quiet, and silent chronic illness, um, blindness, other mobility impairments, the, the gamut, the hearing impairment. So that's a diverse group in and of itself, right? And so I would say that um, belonging to this, I'll, I'll call it a proud and struggling minority group, because I'm politically active. I'm always fighting for people like me to be treated equally and fairly, right? And so that means women, people with disabilities, people who come from first generation to, to college backgrounds, like all the different little boxes I check off personally. What, how that has advantaged me is I do believe that it's given me some added modicum of sensitivity to the marginalization experience that people of color might experience, um, people with language barriers might experience, um, people with who are like targeted for deportation might experience, do you know? So it's like the, 
So it's flipping that, um, that struggle into a kind of consciousness that enables me to understand people a little bit more and where they're coming from, and then to try and be present for liberation and equality. So I'd like to ask my next question, which is how can we effectively increase diversity in tech fields? Well, my husband's, for you ladies who may not know, my husband's the chancellor of this UC Davis, so or president. Yeah. They're chancellor, the president, something. Um, so increase in diversity has to start even younger than you ladies, for sure. Um, uh, you have to start thinking about when you're younger um, that math and science, well, he and I always say, uh, you know, people would say, oh, I'm not good at math and science. Well, you can't, how is that said? And that used to be said a lot. And, oh, you can't say, I'm not good at English. <laughs> so it's like, why do people say I'm not good at math and science? So that has to, that has to not exist anymore. And I think that that's increasingly going away. But when we were younger, that was a common statement. Oh, you're good at math and science, you're not. But you couldn't say I'm not good at English. Um, so increasing diversity has to start younger in these programs. So I, what's great is that you guys have Girls Who Code, you've got STEM programs. Um, this gets um, younger people thinking about STEM and not just necessary IT, but medicine like your mom. That's important too, because we need you in the biological sciences as well. You know, um, The programs help too, but also it's important to the high school. You guys are our, you know, we need you too like encourage all the girls to apply. I've seen so many girls in high school who went AP biology and, and AP calculus and then they're like, oh, I wanna, be, I wanna do something completely different. It's like, what, you've got the skill set. I mean, you do have to follow your passion and love what you're doing, but if you're gifted in that area, it becomes that much easier. I never work a day in my life as I'm doing something I love and it becomes natural. And so, um, that, that encouragement from the high school is key for me, is what I think. Sure, yeah, I'm happy to say things about the high school. Um, yeah, no, the, with the high school and the junior high, um, getting students, getting girls uh, interested in tech early, right? And, um, and not having to, you know, I don't expect that every student in my computer science class is going to go on to become a computer scientist. I'd love that, but. You know, the real, real reality is, um, as long as they've got some grounding, some background in how computers, how technology works, and some confidence in their ability to solve a problem that comes up uh, in technology or to teach themselves a new skill that's needed um, for whatever they're, they're, they need to do, um, those are all like really, really key and important. Um, and so you're all here right now, which is fantastic, um, but as the question was, you know, what can we do to increase that diversity? Bring more friends in, right? Uh, talk to your, talk to other girlfriends. Say, hey, maybe we should try out this class. Um, when I had so last year, I taught a, a middle school computer science class for the first time, and I had only three girls in it. There were only seventeen students, but there were three girls in my class, and. I was intentional, you know, when we did recruitment, I asked those girls to come to sit at the table, right? And they were amazing, and, and they did a fantastic job in the class, and they recruited, but still, this year, my, uh, my, my ninth grade computer science class has 32 students in it, and three girls. So, I was really disappointed to see that, right? I thought, like, you know, we're making this more accessible, we're making this more interesting, um, but it wasn't enough. So, I think being thoughtful about uh, events like this, what can we do, what opportunities do each one of us individually have, um, what, what opportunities, what impacts can we make um, in order to to reach that, that goal, right, that we're all kind of striving for, so, um, yeah. So, uh, one thing that, uh, you know, is important for me as like sort of part of the institution now is, uh, and has also been like really important for me personally, is that there's a lot of second chances also. It's not like you have to decide at the age of 11 that you are gonna be you know, a, a tech giant or a computer programmer or whatever. Um, 
you know, you're going to change your mind. Most people change their minds a lot over the course of their career, right? And uh, so, uh, in terms of um, uh, you know improving diversity in industry and at the university and everywhere else, um, it's important for the people who are running those institutions to make it easy for people to change their minds, right? You don't have to come in to college as a CS major, but there should be an opportunity for you to get enough programming courses that if you want to get a tech job when you graduate, it, you're going to be able to do that. Um, uh, when I, um, uh, the way I got into graduate school in computer science was that I had been working in industry for several years, but my undergraduate degree was in something else entirely. And uh, 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 there was this uh, uh, program that was designed exactly for people like me. They were like, you know, we want people who majored in something else, have experience in industry, and want to go to graduate school in computer science. I was like, yes, yes, that would be me. And they, they just sort of funneled me right into uh, good graduate schools. So um, second chances, yeah, ways to give people second chances. I, I always think that, especially what Mr. Glanz was saying, is that letting your friends know that you're interested in this, saying, Oh, I took this computer cl science class. I loved it. You should try and join it with me because t you tend to want to have your friends around me, you. And so if I tell my friends, oh, you should take this class with me, I'll have my friends over. And we're also making more women in that field interested. And so if you tell your friends, I'm taking this, I love it, you should try and maybe give it a shot. Or you get yourself, for me, I got involved in the community. I started co-facilitating third to fifth grade girls. This is what I love. This is what, why don't you try it out? You start when you grow older or even now, tell the younger one generations, this is what you can do. Then they'll decide this is really influential. I should try. And so just start at an age, just pinpoint someone and say, you should try. You, you have potential. Do you okay. Um, so another question I have here is, what is something interesting about you that cannot be learned through your resume? <laughs> I'll go. You go. Okay. Um, I was once saved from a bear by a calico cat. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can kind of, on that line, um, I once went sledding on a glacier that was on the side of an active volcano in Chile. important. <laughs> well, I didn't run. The cat saved me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Th those are very interesting points. Yeah, they, I mean, they are definitely something that your resume won't say about you. <laughs> um, I would like to ask for <laughs> the, um, for, for the students here, I want to hear kind of what was your favorite class in high school or even college that just kind of maybe drove you either to your profession or maybe had nothing to do with your profession at all? So I mentioned that I majored in something else. What I majored in was um, classical civilization, which is like Greece and Rome. It was kind of like, you know, majoring in Lord of the Rings or something. <laughs> You know, I was a real uh, fantasy-oriented kid, um, and uh, uh, so that was great. You know, and I had I had uh, you know 
fascinating classes in that. You know, I had that, like, um, you know, uh, uh, I, I remember like one class about uh, the letters of St. Paul. I mean, I'm not even, I'm Jewish, I'm not even Christian, you know, but <laughs> it, it was just fascinating, you know, because you like, think of these things as like letters that somebody actually sent, you know, there was a person who wrote this. What were they thinking? What were the people receiving it thinking? You know, it was really interesting. So there's a, there's a ton of interesting stuff out there. There really is. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so when I was in high school, I had kind of known that I was going to be going down the STEM. I was really interested in that, so I, and, and career-wise, and, and as you had mentioned, right, once you're in university studying STEM field, it's, it's real busy. You get a lot of courses, a lot of challenging courses. So when I was in high school, I chose um, to take every culinary course that was offered at the high school. Uh, I really like to eat. Um, my parents were wonderful, but the cooking was not really their forte, and some of my friends' parents were like fantastic cooks. So I knew that was a skill that I wanted um, for myself, and uh, it ended up not only paying off for being able to, to cook for myself, but uh, throughout college, actually high school and college, and then even for a little while before I went back to grad school, I worked in restaurants. So I was able to always get jobs wherever I was living um, as a line cook. Uh, met some fantastic, really interesting people in those careers, um, and it was just one of those things where, like, you know, as you said, kind of, there's opportunities for second chances. I was in the, I was in the, the, the food and beverage industry and thinking maybe this is actually a career. I said, no, I don't think so. I'm going to go pursue education. But uh, having those skills and, and things like that and that experiences uh, has definitely been you know, wonderful. So yeah, definitely my favorite classes were my cooking classes. So uh, my favorite class came way after my baccalaureate degree um, at the Davis Center, you know, this community college extension from Los Rios. They have this wonderful community college satellite out here on the west side in the village. And it was um, ancient art history. And I mean, of all things, because I had a psych background and, you know, more counseling, human services, but literally the ancient art history, it exposed me to like the architecture of ancient Egypt, right? And some of the incredible engineering solutions that the ancient Romans and the ancient Greeks, and even let's go over to, you know, Mesoamerica. At the same time, in parallel, you had uh, Incan, well, formal pre-Incan uh, civilizations who were creating uh, pukios. So pukio is like a, it's an aqueduct, right? It brings water to the surface, but these people were in the Nazca Desert, which is still the most arid region on Earth, and these people literally had designed aqueducts that could bring water to the surface, grow enough food for their massive civilizations. These things still work today. I mean, most of the Caesarean aqueducts can't claim that. These things still work today, and so I became really interested in technology, essentially, but technology is created by the ancients. And I started to feel a little disgruntled about how it is that, you know, modern engineering believes that it leans on only Greek and Roman, for the most part, Western, European, and, well, Greek and Roman uh, origins. But we have a lot of incredible technological history in other uh, populations and civilizations that have been kind of systematically by curriculum uh, left out. And I'm really interested in bringing those, uh, those technologies back. And, and I still to this day can never understand why Egyptology is a British discipline. Like, it's almost like they grabbed Egypt and they're like, oh yeah, but Egypt, that's not Africa. No, that's Africa. Do you know what I'm saying? So that kind of stuff is interesting to me and that's, and that, that really kind of jazzed up my counseling that I provided in the engineering field. So then working with students from, you know, some of these backgrounds, it was like, hey, did you know that, you know, you know 10 generations ago, like, the people were making these very, very advanced technologies, astronomy, astro, astronomical inventions, and all kinds of mathematical uh, solutions to the natural world around us that, um, that now we're, we're asked, and I think that we should 
embrace and give credit where credit's due for. Yeah. And you would have passed this mic. Well, I, I'm, I'm sorry. My favorite class was calculus, math, calculus, math, calculus, math. I, I mean, when I was in college, I was like, okay, I know I'm getting an A in calculus all through college, all through high school. That was my easy A. That was my easy A. English was horrible. I actually took Shakespeare to avoid writing papers. <laughs> so, but I mean, yeah, math is noted. All right, so what is something that's most important in your life and what drives you? That's my next. Well, uh, uh, no doubt a daughter like you. I have two daughters and this young lady is amazing. You know, and the moms here, there's no doubt, right? Your girls, your kids are the most important thing that drives you. And that's why your moms brought you here today. Am I right? They want you to learn a little bit. Um, yeah, so I, at the top of my list would be a young lady like you, my two daughters. They are my, my joy. That's why I do all that we do. And um, being um, at on Davis campus, it's a lot of work, a lot of meetings, a lot of things. Actually, I, I'm doing an interview tonight at Mondavi Center. This is part one of a part two. But my life is so busy, but um, I'm happiest when I'm with my girls. Nice. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know, I like being here and I like being busy. I don't have kids. You don't have to have kids. <laughs> um, uh, so I mean I like the I like being here and I like being so busy. I like, you know, having lots of students and being able to, to give something to them. Um, and I like creating things that didn't exist before. It's it's exciting. You know? Exactly. Look at it that way. Yeah. I was gonna say I, I don't have bi I don't have biological children, but I always joke that I have 162 kids this year and that'll yeah. change in the next couple years. But yeah, so, so I think what's motivating me right now is, uh, and I think has in the past, right, is seeing what can we do uh, to make this world better, right, to leave the world a better place. And, and I know it sounds cheesy, um, but that's initially why I got into, so I studied uh, biology in college, and I, I love being the outdoors, and so I was always thinking, well, what can we do to conserve the natural resources, right, um, our forests and all those kinds of things. Um, and I worked for the Forest Service for a number of years, kind of, you know, of my hands in it, like, like really doing the science and doing some of those things, which was phenomenal. Um, but I also felt like, you know, it's the next generation and passing that, that uh, enthusiasm, that passion on was gonna be, you know, where I could have the biggest impact. But then when I got into it, um, I mean, I still love teaching biology and I love teaching general science. Um, I was noticing both the need um, for a more technologically literate generation to come up and, and, and help us, and also the lack of educators, particularly at the middle school and high school level, like the lack of teachers that were teaching those skills, um, because there's this, there's this gap. It's no fault on the educators, but most of us didn't have a chance to take a lot of computer science courses, or if we had the opportunity, it wasn't prioritized. And so now we have a lot of teachers today who are lacking confidence in teaching that kind of subject matter because, so every day I go into my classroom, I'm pretty confident that I am not the expert in the room on whatever it is that we're learning related to CS. It's very different in my biology class and in my general science class. Um, the students with the, with the computer science, right, they've done some self-learning or they've got this concept and boom, they're going with it. And, uh, and I love that, right? And that's really, that gets me excited every day in the classroom when it's, it's me going around saying, hey, that, that's a cool thing, you, how'd you do that? Or when somebody asks me for help and I say, I, I don't know, I don't know, let's figure this out, right? Um, and then we go through that process and the kids are able to come up with these like really amazing solutions that I've never dreamed of. So, um, yeah, way to talk around the question. Why did you want to be a teacher of tech science? Why did I want to be a teacher of tech science? Awesome. Um, so, it was fun, or it is fun. So I've always brought in a little bit. I took I took one computer science class as an undergraduate. It was an intro to computer science. Um, so I had a little bit of a background. And when I worked in the Forest Service, uh, because I had that little bit of confidence, just that little bit, uh, but I knew at least, I don't remember exactly what, what I learned in that class. But what I do know is that I came out of that class with the confidence that if something goes wrong on my computer, I can figure out how to fix it. And so when I was in the Forest Service, um, I thought I was just going to be going out there. I worked as a botanist, so identifying plants. Right? Um, and it turned out they needed support with um, their mapping software. 
And so they asked the department, is anybody interested in learning this? And I said, yeah, you know, that seems interesting. And I have confidence in myself to be able to learn that technology. So I went out and did it and it led to some great opportunities. So as I was teaching general science, I had a lot of students asking me, hey, can we do computer science? I really like to code. But I also noticed there was a pretty significant gap that there was some students who asked me about coding and who asked me about computer science and who knew a lot about it. But there were a lot of students who didn't ask me about it, right? And a lot of students who never had that exposure early on. So I felt like I could make a big difference by being a person to offer those opportunities to the entire school population and get more, more kids interested in it in the beginning. So, uh, and, and the classroom itself, it's like, it's really fun when it's, you know, just, it's just a problem solving course and the kids get really excited about it. So as a teacher, I can, I can feed off that energy each day. So what do I like about technology? Was that the question? Uh, what? The question was, what's, uh, what's the most important thing in your life in your job? Oh, most important thing in my life right now is this election. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. Okay, oh, let's start. Okay, so. <laughs> um, but specifically, it's truly, and I'm glad we've got some high schoolers in here, it's getting young people engaged in the political process, getting their voice on. It's massive voter registration drives. No matter who you pick, I'm just looking for your generations to start to define what's important, how long we're gonna think about it, and what we're gonna do about it. Because, I mean, we failed. I'm gonna be true. Um, you all will be inheriting this planet, which is skating on thin ice, right? Y'all see it, right? Um, you all will be in inheriting this globally tense set of conflicts um, that we, our generations, have created or maybe not done enough to solve and fix and prepare a way for you all to thrive. And so, I mean, this is where engineering and technology comes in, right? So. What I invite you to think about, you know, for the rest of your of your primary and secondary schooling, and then as you pick a major and go off to college, and I know you all will. I don't think it's a question of if; it's going to be when and where. Y'all should. Um, is you don't have to necessarily know what you're passionate about, and so sometimes when I'm coaching um, pre-college students, I don't lead with that question or if I do and it's falling flat because who knows what they're passionate about at 16 they may not know yet I say something like well what outrages you you're looking around this world I know you see stuff in this world that you're not satisfied with or that might give you some fear about the future these are also good points of departure things you're passionate about and things that outrage you that you're not satisfied with that you can leverage the blessings of a higher education to make impact and change, you know what I mean? So let both of your curiosity, or all of your curiosities, your passions, if you know what they are yet, you know, and also what really dissatisfies and outrages you or maybe even makes you afraid, like meet those things in their face and do something, you know what I mean? Like leverage your education to to make change so that you can hand a better world to your next generation. All right, thanks. My next question is, what do you like to do in your free time? I'm sorry. I don't have free time. <laughs> but um, I, we, I do like to travel. I've, been all over the world and just name a place. I haven't awesome. had experiences like that, but yeah. Yeah. travel, I think travel uh, removes bigotry. So um, if you have any predispositions about cultures and women and this and that and who's this and that, just travel the world and you'll open your eyes up and um, expose you to different things. Um, and I'm talking anywhere, third world countries, this, that, you know, not just your Paris, Italy, but just, yeah. you know, go to Peru or somewhere. Fun, but anyway, I like to travel. 
Yeah, I agree. I like to travel. And one of the great things about being at a university is that you get to travel a lot. You know, you, you, you and and you know, some corporate jobs are like that too. You know, you want to, you know, if that's what if that's your thing, you know, you can get paid to do it, which is great. Um, uh, yeah, I think other than that, I'm mostly kind of a homebody person. I cook for my husband and my mom, and I like to work in the yard and stuff like that. I'm not, I'm not, uh, you know, I mean, I do sports things because it's important. Like, uh, you know, it is important to be fit. It's true. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Um, so, free time, um, I, I guess I'd say an outdoors enthusiast. Um, so, uh, snowboarding is my biggest thing in the winter time, and uh, hiking and camping is uh, is my go-to in the in the summer. So I spend a lot of time uh, up in the hills, up in the Sierras, um, whenever I get a chance. I think for me, it's um, road trips with my dog and my husband. We take advantage of being here in Davis. Like it's often been said, like Davis, that's in the middle of nowhere, and I'm like, no, Davis is at the center of everything. You know, we're 90 minutes to that beautiful lake and 90 minutes to that beautiful sea and uh, 90 minutes to an awesome city. I think the best city in the West with all the cultural and civic opportunities we could possibly, you know, jump into in San Francisco, 20 minutes from Sacramento. So there is a lot of day trip travel to experience nature and then also, you know, uh, what we've all co-created here in beautiful Northern California, culturally, artistically, geographically, everything. Um, and then um, travel abroad, yeah, like you. So we don't get away a lot, but now my husband and I have made it a goal, you know, just once a year to go somewhere radically different and just go, you know, without expectation, but curiosity and just plop ourselves in and watch, listen, learn and jump in, you know. And like you say, it does reduce, it. well, it's, it transforms your worldview. It really does. Like we think we know so many things and that so much is going on, but now having traveled to different places and then having that frame of reference when I'm in the middle of maybe like a blind spot, I'll be like, oh, yeah, but there are people on the other side of the world right now um, thinking about this differently and solving this differently or, um, you know, yeah, I just love the concept of like all the places that I've that I've ventured to, like they still exist and they're like a breath away if I'm feeling bored or uninspired by what the present moment holds. Like, oh yeah, but there's Lake McDonald up in Glacier National Park and then I start thinking about it and I, my heart starts beating, it's so great. So I would say like travel, try to get around, try to go do and see things so that you have that, just that experience set. I'll, add, I'll actually add one more thing too, and that is just uh, in general in my free time, like learning new things. So taking whatever opportunities. So I read a lot of books and go down weird rabbit holes. I listen to a lot of podcasts now because um, it's just a great way to like consume information, right? And, and like learning different things, whether they're related to my current field or just something that I'm interested in. So. I also, I also love to travel. It's, it's just something that for me, I when I travel somewhere, find somewhere like when I went to Ireland, we just kind of, I shadowed a, um, I basically interviewed a director for a movie, um, Cartoon Saloon. She had was directing such a beautiful, well-made film called uh, The Breadwinner. If any of you heard about it, it's about a woman, a girl in, uh, who basically helps her family out, and it, it was. I always find a way when I'm traveling how to put that in what my future career might be. And it's always interesting taking different viewpoints of different cities, see just their style of just innovation. Um, so lastly, my other last question is, if I could have asked you any other question, what would have it been? <laughs> Yeah, if I could have asked you any question, what would it be? And then after that, they will ask you any questions too.
yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one that seems good is like, what did, what did you wish that you knew when you were in high school or junior high? That's a, you know, um, boy, and I gotta say, like I mentioned that I was a real, um, uh, you know, fantasy fan. You know, I was like off in my own little world and it never really occurred to me that I was gonna grow up. <laughs> and so it took quite a while to, to figure out, you know, where exactly I was gonna fit into the world. Um, and uh, I, I think at the time, I, I wish that I had spent not a lot, but like a little bit more attention at the time to, you know, sort of what the adult world was around me and, and uh, thinking about the fact that there was a future. I, you know, it, it's very hard when you're, when you're, when you're uh, you know, a young person and you've got your, you know, high school world. It's very hard to think outside that box. And the next thing you know, you're going to be like booted out of that box and <laughs> you're going to have to face it. Yeah. Okay. Well, what I just say one question that I always get is um, how did I balance a career with a husband with his job and my kids are somewhat normal but <laughs> and then the other question I get is how am I making a difference for for the future women in the world so um, th those are two questions that I always get and um, well I already talked about earlier how I made sure I hired more um, girl uh, software developers and try to increase those numbers but um, if you choose to get married or not get choose to get married or have kids or no have kids um, you just go day by day I always tell people it wasn't like oh I have this you know plan and this and we're gonna do this by they're 12 and da 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 it's just getting through each day and trying to figure out the course and you, you my girls are different I have one girl who's very um, High maintenance. <laughs> who and none of you girls are like that. She likes um, certain fashion things. She likes to eat sushi, and then have another girl who likes Chick Fil A. And so when you when you have different girls, you just balance it the way you know, and you don't treat all. I didn't treat my kids different in that regard, but different personalities change that. And then um, you know, it's good for me. I had a good network. My mom was around me, so she kind of helped me. So grandparents not that bad um, if you have to spend time with them, but my mom was a big help, so anyway. Um, I guess one thing that, I don't even know how the question would be framed, but one thing that I think would be cool to share. Um, so I have three younger sisters, uh, and two of them have had a career change. Uh, and both of them have gone from, uh, one was a social worker, the other one studied linguistics, um, and both of them have changed careers and are now in tech and like doing really, really well and, and loving it. Um, so my youngest sister, who I still call my baby sister, she's 22 now, but she was 12 years younger. So um, she was the one who studied linguistics uh, in Buffalo and took one programming class uh, in order to, to study the, whatever she was studying in, in, in her field uh, and was like, wow. Like, this is just like solving puzzles all day. Like, and I think she's got that feeling of never feels like she works a day in her life. Um, and right out of college, she was hired by the, the, the city. She works in City Hall now. Uh, she makes more than all of her older siblings, you know, with her four-year degree. And, uh, and they're just like really happy with it. My other sister, um, after she had her second child, was like, I need more flexibility in my life. She worked as a social worker for a school district in uh, inner city St. Louis. And so she's like, I, I, I love this job, I'm super passionate about it, but I need to have more time with my kids. And she went to one of those coding boot camps. So she did it online as she was working, developed some skills, and now she's got job offers rolling in that are gonna allow her uh, opportunities to work from home some days and just have more flexibility. So um, yeah, I don't know what the question was that would have brought that out, but my little sisters are awesome. And kind of just examples of like women in tech and, and that idea of, I guess, in their middle school and their high school years, they would have never thought of themselves in the roles that they currently find themselves now, but that there are those opportunities. Can I just throw one more thing in there? Calculus. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's tempting not to take it, you know? But the fact is that, you know, it, it opened, 
the fact is it opens up a lot of doors for you. So even though, you know, in, in, in your high school mindset, you know, the importance of calculus is really not clear. Um, <laughs> it opens up a lot of doors further on. And so it's, it's, it's good to take it. Absolutely. And I will say though, to add to that too though, um, you've got to learn to walk before you run. So if you go and look at a calculus textbook or you think about that and, and it's not quite there yet, don't think because you don't get calculus today that you right. can't get into these STEM careers, right? Like, I, so, yeah. so that idea, right. I, take calculus, take the maths. They are more fascinating the deeper you get into them, mm -hmm. but there is a, a learning curve where you're going, why am I learning these things, right? And then all of a sudden, it opens up and you can see how it makes these real connections to the world around you. But also, if, it's, if that's intimidating to you in this mm -hmm. moment, like know that, you know, over time, you can dive into these things and, mm -hmm. and, and yeah, yeah. It'll go. We, have people, we have people you know who, who didn't take it in high school and then took it in junior college or we have people who didn't take it in junior college and took it when they came to UC Davis as a junior I mean it, it you know there's it's a it's something you have second chances with again but it's something you have the opportunity to do right here in high school so So I'm glad you both brought that up. I guess what, um, I, I wouldn't know how to phrase the question, but I would say that something important to keep in mind is don't think that if you're an 11th or 12th grader and you may not have all the college prep down with perfect grades, that it's over and that you can't, do you know? I mean, so um, I'm a big, I'm a product and I'm a fan of the community college transfer pathway. And so I invite all of you to examine what that is and what that looks like. Um, the idea that if you don't have the money or you may not have the course completions and the four-year eligibility by the time you're 17 or 18 and a senior, um, you can happily go to your nearby community college, which is a phenomenal lower division education, arguably delivered better than we do here at UC Davis, no offense, Nina, but in the lower division, you've got your, you know, you've got your calc and your physics and your CS1 and all of these kind of baseline freshman requirements that we would be requiring our frosh engineering students to take here. And um, you would take them in parallel at the community college with like 30 people in the classroom, a teacher that isn't completely sidetracked with research or, or overwhelmed with a lot more commitments than just teaching you and making, teaching you calculus in a way that you get it and you're not weeded out of a 400 person lecture tank that sits vert more vertical than these seats. Do you know what I'm saying? So know that that education, those first two years at a community college as taken on the transfer pathway are identical to the academic challenges we'd be giving to our undergrads here as frosh and sophomores. And if you, for any reason, don't have the biomaturational readiness, the money, um, or whatever the ability is, or the you know four-year college eligibility out of your senior year, you can have a blank slate at a community college and start over and explore in a much cheaper, lower risk environment. But that's not to bag on UC Davis because I ultimately transferred here and it was awesome. But I just want everybody to keep in mind that, you know, going from the senior year right into that freshman year uh, at a four year institution is, is not for everybody and it actually doesn't really happen for most students, even out of UC, da out of, excuse me, Davis High or Da Vinci. It isn't, it, I'm maybe at Da Vinci, I don't know, I'm sorry, I don't wanna speak for Da Vinci's stats. But you know, um, or any of the other high schools you stem from, uh, community college is an awesome and available open access pathway. It's, you're in the door, there's no, there's no grilling of you to walk on a use, uh, community college campus and get in. Like there's no qualification that you have to meet except for having finished high school or have a GED, okay? So don't give up. You know, there's, it's never too late. And like he said, and like you said, it is never too late. If you have a passion or a curiosity about STEM or you want to leverage STEM training to, you know, solve one of these things that outrages you, like the cancer rates, the dirty water, the air, you know, I mean, the, the things that we're facing with sea rise, 
the, um, the capitalist markets that are crushing some of us beneath their boot. So there's so many fields that technology can apply to and make change in. Don't ever give up if you decide you want to be that change maker and you'll find your path. Okay, good. Alright, so I, I just want to know if there's any quick uh, additional questions. Uh, we're getting close to three, so um, is there any really quick questions anyone has? Otherwise, I will move on to our next segment. Alright, I will move on to our next segment. We, um, so, I'd like to thank all of you for speaking over here. It was really, um, insightful and it was a really awesome experience and I would also want to thank all of you uh, for your t uh, attention and participation that was really lovely so we will be heading outdoors shortly on the patio um, in front of this building for reception uh, in addition to today's speakers we have four women from the UC Davis gender equity in IT group who will be available for you to talk during the reception so could they please stand up and say hi when I call out their names? Kira Dunn? Kira Dunn? Okay. Okay. Uh, Puneet Gill? Puneet is a master's in computer science from Sac State and works on electronic medical records at UC Davis Health. Um, Yana Sharon Yak Filkov? Uh, Yana works in informa information technology applications at UC Davis Health. Amy Slavish. Amy works in computer and network management and on the UC Davis Health's electronic health records and billing team. So I hope uh, I've learned a lot today from amazing speakers, and I hope you guys did too. And so. We can all head outside now for the concluding part of this event. Thank you. Thank you.